Good morning, everyone. Thank you for us for our 9 o'clock Bible class. Is that about right? Is it too loud? Okay. Need to come down just a hair? All right, Russ. They say need to come down just a little bit. All right, is that better? Very good. Thank you for joining us for our 9 o'clock Bible class. And boy, I have to say, what a joy, what a joy it is to be back in Sunday school. I didn't realize how much I missed getting to be in Sunday school. I really missed it, and I hope you did as well. I'm so glad that we can be back together again. If you do not have a foundations study guide and you need one, Andy has some available. If you'll just raise your hand, we will bring one to you. All right, right back here in the back and right over here. A couple over here. There we go. Very good. And I think there are some more at the hallways just outside the door. One in the back back there. We want to make sure everyone has one. Now that you do have your Foundations Bible Study Guide, you might be opening it just page 23. Page 23, that will be lesson number three. I hope you also brought your Bible, and I would ask that you be opening it to chapter 2 of the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. While you're busy doing all of that, I want to begin by expressing my heartfelt appreciation to Dr. Lloyd for allowing me to participate with him in the presentation of this class. I think we all understand. I certainly do. This is his class. He's been doing it and doing it very well for a very long time. He does not need my help in making sure that this class comes. He has very graciously allowed me to teach every other week, and I, I just want you to know I am very happy to get to work with him in this endeavor. And, and this is not my first time having the opportunity to work with someone who was one of my mentors, someone that... I have always looked up to, not my first time having the opportunity to do something like this. Many of you will remember the name, and you certainly remember the man, Jim Bill McIntyre, who preached at the Great West End Church for so many years. Well, before Brother McIntyre died, he and I helped a congregation. We helped, we worked together, and we helped a congregation that just needed some encouragement, needed some some teaching assistance, some preaching assistance, and somehow, as fate would have it, we were together in that setting, and there we were. Well, Brother McIntyre set everything up, and he would do the first hour, he would do the 9 o'clock hour, the Sunday school hour, and then I would do the second hour, the 10 o'clock hour, the, the preaching hour. And I have to tell you that it seemed completely wrong to me. It seemed wrong to me then, and it still seems wrong, at least to me, even now. It just seemed like that we were doing this, that, that we had the whole thing completely out of its proper order. So I talked to him about it, or I should say I tried to talk to him about it. And I tried to get Brother Jim Bill to switch with me and, and to let me do the 9 o'clock hour and him do the 10 o'clock hour. And I said to him, listen... You are the preacher. You're the preacher. So you preach at 10 o'clock, and, and I'll do Sunday school at 9 o'clock. Brother McIntyre was a little hard-headed about that, and he said, No, sir, I like this arrangement. I like to hear you preach. We're just going to keep it this way. So I said to the congregation, Brother Jim Bill has decided, and he wants to do the first hour. He wants me to do the second hour. But I also have to tell you this, Jim Bill McIntyre has been called by many, and rightfully so, the Prince of Preachers. So that means for you as the congregation, you have the Prince of Preachers at the first hour, you have a general contractor at the second. <laughs> and I told him, I said, I, I just want you to know that I feel like a mule at the Kentucky Derby. And that's about how I feel in this teaching situation as well, but I also feel very, very blessed. And I appreciate Dr. Lloyd allowing me to participate in this. I have been, 
I have been helping. I think that's a good word. I, I hope that's a good word. I, I have been helping churches in struggle for about 30 years now. And wherever I have gone, wherever I have helped, the auditorium class is always where I have landed. It's always where they have put me. And I, you know, I, I'm okay with that. I'm good with that. I, I have loved my auditorium classes. At one particular congregation that was, as we would say in our fellowship, that was between preachers, the elders came to me and they said, Jim, we have decided that during this interim time, that this is a good time, this is the right time, this is the appropriate time to once and for all discontinue the auditorium class. We're going to disband the auditorium class. We have lots and lots of good class offerings that we've worked very hard to establish. A lot of these people are just in a rut. They're just in the habit of going in the auditorium. And we have decided as elders, this is where we make the break. This is where we just let the auditorium class die a natural death once and for all. So you won't have teaching on Sunday mornings. All you'll have to do is just preach. So the announcement was made by the elders what their intention was. And the very first week that they tried it, the members of that class went into the auditorium and they sat in their seats for one hour with no teacher, they sat. So the elders, not to be outdone and not to just easily fold and give in, the elders said, don't worry about it. What we're going to do is next week, we're going to leave all the lights off in the auditorium. It will be dark in there until worship time. And that's going to send a very clear message that we are, we are serious about what we're intending to do. Week number two. The members of that class went into the auditorium and for one hour they sat in the dark. In their seats, in the dark, without a teacher, for one hour they sat. Week number three, I began teaching the auditorium class and did so for about the course of a year. I, I have loved auditorium classes and I, I, I will love this one and I hope you love it as well. And I want to encourage you as life begins to get back at least to a, a, a reasonable facsimile of normal, I'd like to encourage you to invite other folks to come and join us who are not in a Bible class to come and be part of what we're doing. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I hope you are there by now. And last week, Dr. Lloyd walked us through the plight of the believers in thus incredible, severe. And yet the text tells us that they found joy in the Lord, joy that was given to them by the Holy Spirit. They had deep conviction, and they became a model to the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Their faith in God literally became infamous, and they turned from idols. They turned away from false gods to serve the true and the living God, and they were waiting for Jesus to come and provide rescue. Well, when you get to chapter 2, Paul now begins to talk about his own personal suffering and his own calling. So let's read there in the first four verses, and as we read, I'll tell you, you have a text in, in your Sunday school book. I'm going to give you an alternate text on the screen and that way you've got two different texts that you can compare. You yourselves know, dear brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not a failure. Some translations say was not in vain. You know how badly we had been treated in Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. Yet, our God gave us the courage to declare His good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. So, you can see we were not preaching with any deceit or impure motives or trickery, for we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. 
He alone examines the motives of our hearts. We took the message of God, he says, and we shared it. We shared it not to try and please men, but to try and please God. In a culture that is now, I think, obsessed with, with trying to please this group and then that group, with trying to please this person and then that person, I think what Paul is saying here is as fresh and as relevant as today's news. Do not miss Paul saying, brothers and sisters, those of you who have suffered hardship, who have experienced some severe suffering, Paul says, so have I. So have I. I get it. I understand. I have had great opposition to what I am doing. So in your lesson book, there on page 24, if you would look, under the heading that says Introduction, he tells you about some of his suffering. Tells you about some of his own personal opposition that he had faced. He was opposed, of course, by false teachers, those who had wrong motives, wrong agendas. He was opposed by the religious establishment of the day, exactly as Jesus had been. Those with religious position were quite envious of the following that he had. They were also quite scared of the threat that he and that following now presented to their position. And so they gathered mobs against him and they questioned by what authority he came teaching. And they made fun of how he talked and they challenged everything he said, everything he did, with whatever they could do to discredit him. I mean, that sort of sounds like American politics, doesn't it? If you can't defend your own position, if you have no rebuttal to the other side, when all else fails, then what do you do? Attack, attack, attack. Assassinate the other person's character. Call into question the other person's motives. Claim that what he says has no basis in fact. Make fun of him. Make fun of him however you may. And if all else fails, then gather a mob around you and attack. Does any of that sound the least bit familiar? It does, doesn't it? The basic nature of people remains unchanged, doesn't it? But Paul stood his ground. Paul stood firmly on the message that God had given him. He stood firmly on the message to which he had been entrusted. And I also want you to notice, it's important, he stood on his own good conduct. And he says, folks, myself and those who are with me, we as messengers approved by God, we who are the ones that have been entrusted by God with His gospel, with His good news, we are out to please God. We're not out to please people. I think there's something very valuable in that that should not be missed. Now, I want to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm too old to want to fight with anybody anymore, you know? I don't want to be cross with anybody, and I don't think that, that you do as well. But I have to be honest with you this morning and tell you I am at a point in life where I, I really don't care all that much what the world thinks that I need to do. I'm just not too concerned about that. There, there are, I watch the news when I can bear it, and there are so many people and so many groups and so many causes out there telling me, bombarding me all the time and telling me what I am supposed to do and what I'm not supposed to do, what I am supposed to support and what I'm not supposed to support, what I'm supposed to think and what I can't think, what I should say and what is no longer allowed to be said. I can't even keep up with them all. I, I can't tell the players without a program. And so if, if somebody wants to, I think the word is cancel, if somebody wants to cancel me because I believe and I care more about what God says than what anybody else says. That's okay. I, I'm not worried about that. God is the one who knows the motives of my heart. And God is the one before whom I shall stand in the day of judgment. 
God is the one to whom I have pledged my allegiance in Jesus Christ. So if somebody's going to mark me off their list and cancel me, that's okay. I, I'm not worried about that. As long as God is pleased, as long as God does not cancel me, then I'm good. So Paul's enemies would say, let us tell you about this guy. He went down there to Thessalonica and he just wasted his time there. But the results he got would say very different. Paul's enemy was, would say, folks, do you realize this guy's background? Do you understand? They threw him in jail. He's a jailbird. This guy has been locked up. He was in jail when he was in Philippi. Are you going to actually listen to and give credibility to somebody who was in jail? But the people did listen because they saw how sincere he was and they understood that even being in jail didn't make him quit. Paul's enemies would say he is a deceiver. He is a trickster. He's playing tricks on you. His motives are not pure. But God obviously didn't think so because God entrusted to him the good news. God entrusted the gospel to him. Friends, this crazy world that we now occupy is going to challenge every good and godly thing that you now hold dear. And I think we would be naive to think otherwise. I think we should expect it. I think we should anticipate it. It, 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 is, it is the way of the world. But let me give you a little encouragement here. If what you hold dear is of God, then you hold it anyway. And you hold it firmly. And you hold it proudly. And you appeal to others to learn about Jesus. That's our job. You appeal to others to come to know Jesus Christ. You appeal to others to love Him. You tell them about the Son of God who is the only one who can save them from the coming wrath. Do it lovingly. Do it gently. Do it with a great measure of kindness. And then don't worry about it. Let the chips fall where they may. In days gone by when he was alive, I used to just love to hear Brother Marvin Phillips preach. Anytime I could hear Marvin Phillips preach, I wanted to hear him preach. And Marvin Phillips used to say, Brothers and sisters, there are three steps that we must all follow. Are you ready? Number one, be right. Be right. Be right with God. Be right with His Word. That was number one. Then he very quickly said, Number two, be nice. There are a lot of people who are right who are not nice about it. And Brother Phillips would say, if you're not nice about it, even if you're right, no one will listen to you. And then he said, number three, don't back up. Be right, be nice, don't back up. And I think he was right. Well, let's go back to the text now and, and read some more. Let's pick up at verse 5 and read through verse 8. Never once, never once did we try to win you with flattery, as you well know. And God is our witness that we were not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. As for human praise, we have never sought it from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we certainly had a right to make some demands of you, but instead we were like children among you. We were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. Ever had any pretend friends? You thought they were your friends, but they were just pretending? You ever been flattered by someone and they just built you up and they said so many good things about you and it made you feel so good only to find out that there were ulterior motives that were involved. Paul was not a glad hander trying to get something for himself. He was real. He was on a mission from God. He desperately loved the lost and he desperately wanted them to know about Jesus. Now folks, people these days are quite 
suspicious of religion. And in many instances, in many cases, I don't blame them. People are quite suspicious of religion. They think there's a hook in it somewhere. And, and they've heard, they've heard these preachers, you know, you've heard them, who sound like they're a little bit airsick from the trip they just made down from heaven. And, and they read the stories, they've seen them on television about the pretense and the schemes and the plots that are all devised to get money, to get you to send money. They've seen the great desire for human praise and it turns them off. You know, when you're a preacher and you stand at the back door and people come out and they shake your hand and they tell you how good this was and, oh, you did such a fine job and all, and, and all of that's nice and fine. That's not where Paul was. That's not where Paul was. I preached at a place one time where there was a particular brother, and he was a good guy. I'm not impugning his character, but he would come in every Sunday and he would pick a seat right on the end of a pew. And there was a reason for that. He would then get a songbook and he would put the songbook right here on, on the arm of the pew, and then he would put his elbow on the songbook, and then he would put his head in his hand. And you know what he did then? He took great notes, right? He went to sleep. He slept the entire time that I was up there. I wanted so badly during the course of the lesson to just walk down very quietly and just knock the songbook out from under his elbow, you know, and watch his head hit the end of the pew. But he would come to my door every single Sunday, every single Sunday as we were leaving, and he'd stick his hand out and he would shake my hand and he would say the same thing every time. He'd say, brother, I sure did enjoy that. And it was true. I'm not going to call him a liar. It was true. My sermon time was the best sleep he got all week. I didn't take... I didn't put much stock in his, in his compliment. You understand? Paul kept his own integrity because Paul was concerned about maintaining the integrity of the message. Now on page 28 in your book, if you'd look please, near the end of the first paragraph, right near the end of the first paragraph, you will see a quote from Michael Holmes and that quote says, he, Paul, deliberately avoided behavior or actions that might lead people to doubt or suspect the integrity of the message or the sincerity of his preaching. In fact, Paul even tells his readers, he says, listen folks, even though I could have pulled rank on you, so to speak, because I am an apostle, I could have made some demands of you because I am an apostle. I didn't dare do that. Instead, I treated you like a mother does her own children. Now, does that command a lot of explanation? It really doesn't, does it? A mother will sacrifice anything. A mother will sacrifice everything about her own self for the good and the benefit of her children. There is a profound protective passion that a mother has for her children that cannot be matched by anything else. It is a, it is a fierce fire that cannot be stopped. It cannot be quenched. And Paul claims it as the manner in which he loves these Thessalonians. So now we come to verse 9, and he shifts from the example of a mother to that of a father. Go back to the text now. Let's read 9 through 12. Don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you? Night and day we toiled to earn a living so that we would not be a burden to any of you as we preached God's good news to you. You yourselves are our witnesses. So is God that we were devout and honest and faultless toward all of you believers, and you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. We pleaded with you. We, we encouraged you. We urged you to live lives in a way that God would consider worthy, for he called you to share in his kingdom and in his glory. Personally, I appreciate the fact that while... Paul preached the gospel among these people. He worked. He, he supported himself. 
And I have no intention whatsoever, not qualified to do it, of opening that whole discussion about preachers getting paid and what a preacher gets paid and all that. I just don't want you to miss that Paul worked and placed no financial obligation upon the believers. More than that, I want you to see the fact that Paul gave no one opportunity to say, well, he's just doing it for the money. Do you know what they're paying this guy? Do you know what kind of money he's getting out of all of this? He's just doing it for the money. He gave no opportunity for that accusation to be made. Paul and his companions were devout. They were honest. They were faultless. They encouraged people. They even pleaded with people to live for God and to share in His kingdom and in its glory. To me, that is, that is so very refreshing. Just like a father who is trying to teach an example before his own children, Paul did so with the believers. Now back to your Sunday school book in the application section of your book. You'll find that on page 30. The application section, our lesson writer makes this statement. The conduct of those who proclaim the gospel matters. And that may be the most important thing that the lesson writer says in this entire lesson number three. The conduct of those who proclaim the gospel matters. It matters. Would you agree with that statement? It matters. I, I told you as we began that for about 30 years now I've been, I have been involved in helping and that I hope that's the appropriate word in helping some churches in struggle. Say, so well, what does that mean? Well, you know what it means. And what that means is that most of the time, somebody's called and asked me to come teach and to preach and to just, just try and be an encouragement in what you might call a less than favorable situation. Is that a diplomatic way to put that? Could I tell you that 99.99% of the time, the root issue has to do with those who have been entrusted with the gospel, who have not conducted themselves in a manner that is worthy of it. And no, I'm not going to tell you the names of those congregations, so don't ask me. And no, I'm not going to tell you the name of those people in order to protect the identities of the guilty. But I will tell you that not one single time in all of those years, not a single time have I faced a situation where the issue that was going on, the fight that was going on, the disruption that was going on was about doctrine. Not one time. Not one time has an eldership ever called me and said, uh, uh, Jim, we, we got a little problem. We'd like to talk to you. Wonder if you could come help us a little bit. We have had a preacher who decided that Baptism and the Lord's Supper really don't matter anymore, and now we've got a problem. Not a single time, not one. Not one time has an elder called to say, we, we've lost our preacher in a fight about the literal virgin birth of Jesus, about his literal bodily resurrection, about the true nature of his deity. Not once. Can you guess? Can you guess what they have called? and said, and again, no names, but every one of them, a very true example. Well, we've just had a big fight over the preacher, over personalities. And he's fired and some of the elders have resigned and a bunch of our members are leaving and it's a mess. We've just found out that one of our leaders has a girlfriend, it's not his wife. We've just uncovered that money given to our building fund for the construction of our new auditorium has been embezzled. Want some more? We, we hired this guy and we were just sure he was the right one. And now six months later we have parted ways and things are a mess. We, we found out about some addictions. We've discovered some perverse behaviors. And on and on and on and on the list goes. That statement that we just read from your book is so true and so relevant. The conduct of those who proclaim the gospel matters. Now, 
For those of you who think you're off the hook this morning, that that applies only to elders and preachers, you're not, okay? We're all supposed to be about the business of the kingdom and the business of proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. It applies to all of us. We give opportunity. We open the door of opportunity to Satan. We give opportunity to those who are the enemies of God and the enemies of the gospel when we as believers conduct ourselves in such a way that it casts doubt on the message of the gospel. Listen to Paul as he says to them, friends, we pleaded with you. We encouraged you. We urged you to live your life in such a way that God the Father would consider it worthy. Worthy to share in His kingdom. And worthy to share in the glory of that kingdom. And they needed to do that. Jim needs to do that. It makes me very nervous to preach and to teach. And I, I don't mean to stand here at a podium in front of a a class and to conduct a class. That, that's not at all what I'm talking about. It makes me nervous because I know me. And I understand that Jim is in no way worthy. And I understand that being entrusted with the good news of the kingdom of God brings with it the greatest of responsibilities. We need to be careful about that, so careful. So there's eight more verses in this chapter that we need to finish with just now. Let's go back and begin at verse 13. Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. And then, dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea, who, because of their belief in Christ Jesus, suffered from their own people, the Jews. For some of the Jews killed the prophets. Some even killed the Lord Jesus. Now they have persecuted us, too. They fail to please God and work against all humanity as they try to keep us from preaching the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. By doing this, they continue to pile up their sins. But the anger of God has caught up with them at last. Dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come to you, and I, Paul, tried again and again. But Satan prevented us. After all, what gives us hope and joy, and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you. It's you. Yes, you, you are our pride and joy. Now, you let that sink in for a moment. Think deeply about what that means. Remember what Dr. Lloyd told us last Sunday? He began by saying, I'll tell you a little bit about who these people were. These people were idolaters. And he said, they laid all of that down for the one true God. And Paul's repeating that sentiment again as he is saying, they listened and they believed and they accepted the gospel for what it was, not just mere words of men, but it was the truth of God, and it, it cost them. They paid for that. They were persecuted by their own people. Do you realize how easy we have it as believers? And it may be that in our lifetimes, it's not going to be quite so easy. And you know, that may not be the worst thing that ever happened to us. I, I, I read these stories and I read all of the stories in the Bible about those who held tenaciously to the Word of God and believed it to be what it was, the truth of God and not mere words of men. And, and you read their stories and how persecuted they were and the, the untimely and horrific deaths that they met because they would not surrender their allegiance to Jesus. We've not been asked to do that. 
Not yet. And those who had killed the prophets, and those who had killed the very Son of God Himself, those who had persecuted Paul and the other apostles, they were after the people in Thessalonica too, and they'll be after us as well. Paul so wanted and he so longed and so desired to see these people again. Satan had prevented it. But friends, he knew that when Jesus returned, his proud reward, his crown as he stood before his Lord would be all of these brothers and sisters he now had in Jesus who had listened to the good news who had accepted what Paul shared with them and who would not give Christ up even in the midst of their severe suffering. They wouldn't give him up. And Paul said, that's going to be my proud reward. That's going to be my crown. That's what's going to put a smile on my face when I stand before the Lord and I see all of you. I hope we haven't forgotten that there is, there is one message that we are charged to bring to the world. And, and the message can be summed up in one word, in one name. Jesus. 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 And, and everything we teach and everything we preach and everything we live and everything we do, it is all about Him. Not just some about Him, a little bit about Him and a little bit about us. It's all about Him. It's all about Jesus Christ. I think about, I think about five little boys that live there on my farm. In fact, five of those we share with Mike and Rita. They decided that they needed one more than us, and that's okay. Five, five will do just fine. But what would give me greater joy what would I consider to be a greater crown than to someday stand before the Lord and see those five boys there with me? There's not anything. Not anything. And, and, and we are charged, as they were charged, as Paul was charged, to share that message of the Son of God who loved us, gave himself for us. So, the words of this Second chapter, I will leave you with this. I will tell you that these are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being in our class.